minute or so. Um, just as a reminder, we are going to be recording today's session. Everyone is muted uh, throughout, and we're really glad you've joined today. So about 30 more seconds, and we'll get started. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining Child Welfare and Housing Agency Partnerships that support and unify families through Family Unification Program housing vouchers. I'm Andrew Johnson with the Corporations for Supportive Housing, or CSH, and we are really excited by your interest in this important topic. And I'm gonna turn it over to Chris Isom from KC Family Programs to get us started. Good morning. Today's session, or good afternoon, uh, today's session is brought to you by Corporation for Supportive Housing, or CSH, and KC Family Programs. I am Chris Isom, and I'm the National Partnership Advisor with KC Family Programs, and I'm based in Atlanta, Georgia. I've been with KC since November of 2022, and I'm the Partnership Advisor with CS for CSH. I have extensive background in both state and private agency collaborations with communities and families. Prior to Casey, I was the community-based officer agency in Alpharetta, Georgia. I am honored to be here today. Later, you will be hearing from my colleague, Margie Hunt, LCSW, who is the Senior Director of National Partnerships based in Seattle, Washington. Margie has worked in child welfare on prevention and family support for the past 30 years with a focus on communities and lived experience. Margie has been with Casey Family Programs for 22 years and she leads the national partnership team. Moderators for today's session are Deidre Bolden and Andrew Johnson with CSH. Deidre serves as CSH's director in the Southeast and is based in South Florida. She and her team focus on the expansion of housing and service solutions through collaboration with governments, housing authorities, funders, property developers, and other service providers in Florida, Georgia, North and South Carolina, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Prior to CSH, Deidre served as a program manager with the Housing Authority in Atlanta, Georgia. Among many other things, Deidre managed a pioneering platform of supportive housing initiatives that encompasses rental subsidy programs to reduce and prevent homelessness. Andrew, he serves as a director of systems transformation for families and youth with CSH's strategic, or excuse me, strategy and external affairs department, and he is based in San Diego, California. He leads CHS's multi-sector collaborative strategies to shift public systems to an integrated and equitable approach that centers housing and supports that help families and youth and communities to thrive. He has extensive experience in working with housing and homelessness response and public child welfare systems. Prior to working at CSH, Andrew served as a, in Colorado state government leadership and programmatic roles with public child welfare and public housing agencies, including oversight of family reunification program housing vouchers for families and youth. Additionally, you will interact with CSH and KC staff as they are part of today's, and events, today's events and will be engaging with you in the chat and Q&A. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Andrew. Thanks, Chris. So today's session, uh, as you'll see on the slide, really builds from recently released child welfare family housing voucher briefs that we hope you've had a chance to check out. Um, and if not, we'll share the link uh, with you. Um, we're gonna review the family unification program, share a few highlights and opportunities that you may consider. And then that'll be followed by insights from a local spotlight panel. Um, we're then going to discuss some questions from the audience with today's presenters and panelists. So feel free to type your questions in the Q&A section of Zoom. Uh, and we certainly encourage you to engage with each other in the chat as we go along. We're really excited in your interest in this topic and how to potentially maximize uh, family 
unification program housing vouchers um, that really um, will help to provide information that local child welfare and housing leaders can use as they consider how to prepare to maximize uh, this resource in preserving and reunifying children and families. Uh, we will share our understanding of the program and will highlight opportunities and examples throughout. Chris? Thank you, Andrew. Casey, for, Casey Family Programs is a national, is the nation's largest operating foundation, and we are focused on safely reducing the need for foster care and building communities of hope for children and families in the United States. Casey Family Programs believes that every child deserves a safe, strong, and permanent family and every family will thrive with the support of a caring community. Every community can create hope and opportunity for its children and families, and everyone has a role to play in building communities of hope. The cornerstone of building communities of hope is our recognition that we must all work together across systems and sectors, government, business, nonprofit, and faith-based, philanthropic, and community members themselves to think, plan, and act in collaboration to improve the long-term safety, well-being, and hope of children and their families. Ongoing partnership between Casey and Corporation for Supportive Housing, because we know lack of or unstable housing is a contributor to children being removed from their families, as well as lack of concrete supports, such as housing, can be a barrier to children reunifying with their parents timely. We hope that this webinar will show child welfare and their housing partners how to partner together and utilize federal housing vouchers to support and strengthen families. I'm gonna turn it back to you, Andrew. Great. And uh, for over 30 years, CSH has been working to advance affordable housing aligned with services as an approach to help people thrive. And we do this by advocating for effective policies and funding, equitably investing in communities and strengthening the supportive housing field. Um, as you'll see at its core, supportive housing is a type of affordable housing designed for people to have a home in their community and the services that they identify to support them in thriving. Uh, it's typically for people experiencing homelessness or who have had significant experiences of housing instability. And at CSH, we promote an approach to supportive housing that we call keeping families together that is specifically designed to help unify and strengthen families. Uh, and jurisdictions across the country, such as our panelists today, are leveraging a supportive housing approach as the scaffolding for the delivery of more effective and responsive public services and community supports. Also, since 2016, CSH and a number of partners have joined together to advance an initiative that we call One Roof, which uh, is bringing together housing and child welfare partners to really help build better futures for children, youth, and families. Chris? Yes, thank you, Andrew. Um, so just before we get started, wanted to share a little bit of actual data for you guys regarding uh, child welfare uh, and that data and relates to housing. So while this data shows um, that our housing stability only shows, excuse me, where housing stability was reported, we know that it's likely an undercount and it's undercount for many reasons. Um, in addition, it does not, not show families involved with child welfare that were not removed. So those in-home cases or what we call family preservation cases. Um, so in the federal fiscal year of 2021, the adoption and foster care analysis and reporting system, which we call AFCARS, um, gave us some data on the reasons that children were in the entered care. So for abuse, we have 16%. Um, for neglect, it's a staggering 84%. And we know that that neglect category uh, is often um, a category that has uh, many different reasons, removal reasons that are sort of lumped into neglect, um, one of those being housing. Um, but we were able to gather, the feds were able to gather uh, in 2021, the removal reason of inadequate housing in some jurisdictions. So there are some jurisdictions that do uh, pull that data out specifically. And that is 9% of children, which equates to 18,952 children under the age of 18 that entered care that we know specifically that the removal reason was inadequate housing. So we know that that is uh, a, a reason that the, uh, the unification vouchers uh, in this collaboration is very important. Andrew? 
turn it back to you. Great. At CSH, we developed what we call a racial disparities and disproportionality index. It looks at 16 unique systems to measure whether um, a racial or ethnic group's representation in a particular public system is proportionate to over or below their representation in the overall population, and it allows the examination of systemic differences between groups and geographies and provides a standardized comparison between groups. And while we see that there are variation across states, there are very clear equity gaps uh, that exist for families at the intersection of child welfare involvement and housing instability, as you see on the screen. Um, now let's uh, look at who's in the vertical room, so to speak. Um, so there were 463 or more folks that registered uh, for today's event. And we understand that many of you, as you can see, are um, from child welfare and housing. And then there are others you know, from supportive services, lived experience, associations and networks and other uh, systems. And, and um, I think you know there have been. Uh, we can go to the the next data point, which shows that uh, there's a whole range of knowledge and uh, experience with federal housing vouchers for families, such as the Family Unification Program. Um, some who this is your first time hearing, and others who uh, have significant knowledge and expertise. And um, you know, it's been 33 years since the Family Unification Program was created by Congress, and uh, we really see this as uh, an opportunity for those who have been doing this work for a long time to refresh, um, you know, or update your existing approach, to share uh, your learnings in the chat, but also for those that are new to really think about how you might plan for uh, potential opportunity. And, um, you know, we're really trying to support communities to consider how to maximize these resources for families and youth. Uh, provide insights from peers, and uh, also want to highlight that um, while uh, we all have extensive uh, experience in the field, uh, nothing in in today's session is uh, formal guidance directly from HUD um, on on the Family Unification Program. So with that, we also uh, I think both CSH and Casey Family Programs really believe that it's important to center families in our work and uh, include the, the voices of parents. And so with that, I'm pleased to introduce the first of our panelists today, Danielle Goodwin. Um, Danielle wears many hats. Um, she is uh, based in the Seattle, Washington area, is a parent and brings uh, a wealth of relevant lived and professional expertise. Uh, in her career, she works with parents in King County, Washington, and recently completed a year-long Keeping Families Together Fellowship with CSH. So uh, before we go further, Danielle, I just wanted to talk to you for a minute about why today's uh, webinar topic is important to you and how housing vouchers have mattered to you and the families you work with. Excuse me. Yeah, thank you. I, well, first of all, I am a mother of five who benefited from, um, while being involved in child welfare, being able to access uh, a FUP voucher. And that FUP voucher, um, had it not been given, I don't think that I would have been able to, one, get my kids back, two, keep my kids, three, and keep my kids through various crises that we had. Um, you know, despite CPS being involved or not, um, our family endured multiple things, you know, there's, you know, just like everyone, there's death in the family, there's job loss, there's, you know, challenges in school for children, um, behavioral challenges. And so just, you know, those, just one of those things can really derail a family if they are living in, um, in a, in a way that, one little crisis will create homelessness for them or, or 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 what have you. So it's also important to me because I see in the work that I do that there's often this disconnect between um, housing providers and DC, DCFS or, or CPS, not intentional always, actually. I don't think that it's done um, in, a, in a in a way that, you know, to harm families. I think that we're just all trying to do the best we can 
And there's just an overflow of knowledge that comes. Um, you know, as I work as a peer support specialist, um, I I I try to, you know, collaborate and 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 educate housing and educate parents, right? Parents do need to also be educated on, do you know there's this this option? And you know, and you you just so happen to have a case manager whom I know has access to these. Does your case manager know you're a CPS involved? Well, no, I don't want to tell them that. Well, it's really important that you do because we want to get your children back. And last thing is that you can't get your kids without housing and you can't keep your kids without housing. So it's really challenging. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Danielle. Um, I think you know, we're going to have more opportunities to hear from Danielle throughout our upcoming panel discussion, but I hope that um, that, that really, you know, helps start us off, uh, you know, set the tone. And, and I think throughout, we just really have to remember why, you know, why this program was created, how the partnerships can really help to bring folks together and really think about from the lens of parents, what does it feel like when you're in a crisis, you know, and when you have child welfare involved and you don't have stable housing and you may have a court ordered treatment plan and you have all these things you're, uh, you know, you're trying to do in your own, your own histories. Um, so we look forward, Danielle, to hearing more from you. Um, any final thoughts before we, we move to the next section? Um, not that I can think of. Okay, great. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my co-moderator for today, Deirdre Bolden, who will share some general information about the Family Unification Program as some level, level setting uh, for all of us. Deirdre? Thank you, Andrew, uh, very much. And thank you so much, Danielle, for sharing your story and your journey. Um, Congress allocates funding for the Family Unification Program also known as FUP, uh, to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, also known as HUD, who awards funding to public housing, agents, uh, housing agencies to operate the FUP program as part of their Housing Choice Voucher Program. Um, and in some places, uh, many people still refer to its former name of Section 8. In partnership uh, with their local public child welfare agency and others, uh, such as the Homeless Response System, continuum of care and their service providers. Um, we can move to the next slide. Originally authorized in 1990 by Congress to preserve and reunite, preserve or reunite families with child welfare involvement, FUP provides a non-time limited housing voucher for families for whom the lack of adequate housing is a primary factor in one of two things either in the imminent placement of the family's child or children in out-of-home care, or the delay in the discharge from out-of-home care of the child or children to the family, thus reunifying. While not the focus of today's ses discussion, in 2000, Congress actually extended FUP eligibility to young people who exited foster care and lack adequate housing as well. FUP can now be provided for up to 36 months of rental assistance for youth ages 18 through 24 years, who either left foster care at the age of 16 or older, or will leave foster care within the next 90 days, and is currently or is at risk of experiencing homelessness. So today we are really focusing on the housing vouchers for families, primarily FUP uh, for families, we do have plans to offer additional resources in the future that will delve into the federal housing vouchers for youth, including FUP, youth, and foster youth to independent, also known as FYI vouchers. Um, in terms of the housing vouchers um, for FUP, that includes a rental subsidy that is provided to a landlord by the public housing authority. The family enters into a lease for an approved housing unit, and the public housing authority calculates the portion of their rent, uh, of the rent paid on behalf of the family based on their family's income, their size, and household composition. Um, HUD awards most of the family unification program vouchers primarily through competitive notices of funding opportunities or NOFOs, 
And with the most recent being the one that was passed this past spring or the 2020 NOFO. The funding is uh, contingent upon appropriation of new funding in the federal budget. And each NOFO outlines the requirements and rating factors for an applicant. Uh, NOFOs can provide the latest requirements and definitions underneath the FUP program as well. And so you can reference that information on the uh, website for HUD that is being posted in the chat. Uh, it also lists the various public housing authorities and where federal awards have taken place. Next one. We want to speak just a little bit about the partnership roles because this is what really makes uh, is the magic sauce in all of it. Um, and through these partnerships, each entity has a very distinct role where there can be some overlap, especially to make sure uh, that the services and supports the families need are in place. So the public child welfare agencies are the ones who determine whether families and youth meet the child welfare related eligibility and have the housing circumstances. The public child welfare agency then refers, of course, the eligible families to the public housing authority when there is an available uh, housing voucher uh, um, in that community. The public housing authority is the one who determines the final eligibility for the housing choice voucher program, as well as the um, household size. They manage the issuance of those vouchers and host the voucher briefings to review all of the processes and expectations to the families receiving the voucher. The collaboration uh, with the homeless continuum of care is also very key. Some considerations, some jurisdictions have really uh, been intentional in trying to adapt their coordinated access system for homeless response to prioritize family households. The Public Housing Authority, again, is the applicant for the funding. With each new funding application, uh, there must be a new or an updated memorandum of understanding or MOU so that that partnership agreement is uh, still intact between the Public Housing Authority, the Public Child Welfare Agency, and the continued care uh, when that NOFO release and application um, is underway. The agreement should uh, be created, of course, jointly and then updated at appropriate interest. Uh, the NOFO does outline, again, the detailed requirements um, for what really must be specifically addressed in the memorandum of, memorandum of understanding, and they even provide a sample template as well. Some of the recent NOFO's requirements have stated that the MOU should uh, have several things. It should contain a clear and detailed description of the roles, responsibilities, the services being offered, and the commitments from each agency. It should designate the staff from each partner as a liaison and entail very regular collaborative partner meetings. It should have a process for monitoring the voucher utilization. Uh, current FUP programs must have a high average voucher utilization, typically around 90%, to apply for new subsidies, to apply for new vouchers, or to have a plan to reach that utilization within a 12 month period. Uh, agencies that experience low utilization rates are obviously underutilizing this really critical resource, and they could face a risk uh, that HUD might recapture or redistribute those underutilized vouchers to other jurisdictions. And so now let's talk more about the services and supports that are really very critical to the FUP program. While the FUP voucher provides that rental assistance, and that is very important, we recognize that in order to utilize and fully benefit from the assistance, families with child welfare involvement often identify a desire for additional support services and supports. You know, relocating and searching for housing is a very daunting experience in general, let alone you know, the state of your family is highly dependent on securing an appropriate place to live and do that quickly. So we wanted to highlight just a little bit about what has been seen in other recent methods regarding the rating factors that are related to families that can increase the competitiveness of an application. That includes things like the housing sense assistance uh, in low poverty census tracts, making sure we get tours, 
um, having the opportunity to do units and make introductions to landlords. And then, of course, the financial assistance uh, going beyond the rental, but helping with moving costs, security deposits, utility startups, and, and things of that nature uh, that often are very necessary for these households. Um, having previous coordination between the housing authority, the child welfare agency, and the partners involved. Providing post-move counseling that doesn't stop the moment the family moves into the home. home. It uh, requires a lot of uh, additional supports after that. And then again, that ongoing case management to these families and helping them to enroll in other types of self-sufficiency programs. Ideally, family members are supported holistically during and after, again, their child welfare case to help them heal and, and thrive together as a family for the longer term. So I'll turn it back to you, Andrew. Thank you, Deirdre. Um, in, our, in our work across uh, you know, many years and across the country, we've identified some common kind of misunderstandings and some responses uh, to those um, based on uh, our analysis and kind of work with uh, the federal rules and guidance and uh, communications. And so the first one just quickly um, to highlight, and, and I will just, before you go further, mention that the, the briefs that we talked about that, the, that today's event uh, is based on go, go into uh, a little bit more detail and have some uh, links for more information. But the first one that we commonly hear uh, that's kind of a myth is um, that, the child welfare agency cannot refer families for an available family unification program voucher unless housing is, you know, the only thing um, that is leading to child welfare to potentially separate a family or housing being the only challenge left uh, that's impeding family reunification. And uh, there, HUD has clarified, um, and you know, we certainly encourage that mem that the memorandums of understanding clarify that uh, referrals should be made for prioritized families when they're identified, uh, and not only upon successful completion of all the other aspects of the family's case plan. Um, and we know that a delay in a family being referred for a voucher increases the likelihood that the family may not uh, really be fully meeting the intent of this program to be able to preserve or reunify families, um, you know, and really be able to leverage this housing resource uh, to, to most benefit the child welfare and housing outcomes um, of families. And we also know that child welfare agencies and the courts are mandated by um, a number of laws that require some really tight timeframes and quick decisions. Uh, so things, you know, things can change quickly and getting families housed quickly uh, where that housing resource can really um, have the opportunity to change the trajectory of the case is important. Um, furthermore, uh, HUD requires that uh, partners that are um, implementing family unification need to establish a system to identify um, eligible families uh, within the child welfare agency caseload uh, and to review referrals from the housing authority and the homelessness of care and then prioritize families that, that have an open case with sub substantiated reports of child abuse and neglect and uh, whose children are at high risk for out-of-home placement or uh, whose children are already in out-of-home care um, and are at high risk for additional negative child welfare outcomes such as you know long-term open cases, re-entries to the system, um, and, and such. And so really looking at those opportunities where this housing assistance could really help parents to stabilize and participate in the other services that are necessary for preservation or subsequent reunification, uh, you know, where the trajectory of the case um, really can shift and families have a fair shot, have a real chance at uh, success uh, and strengthening as a family. The second one, the second myth that we oftentimes uh, encounter is uh, the idea that as soon as a child welfare agency identifies a potentially eligible family, that they have to immediately send that referral to the housing authority. And you know, if there are currently available vouchers, you know, using that prioritization system that I just referenced, 
that may make sense. If, the, if all of the available vouchers are currently leased up, then uh, in that case, the Child Welfare Agency has 30 days to refer um, a family once they're notified by the housing authority that a voucher is uh, coming available. And a promising practice is really for the Child Welfare Agency and partners to identify the housing needs of families ongoing and then really refer the eligible prioritized families only at the time of an available voucher. That way, uh, the family doesn't end up sitting on a housing authority waiting list. Uh, which some rules on the housing authority side then kick in uh, as far as um, sequencing of uh, serving the families. Um, and it's really important to have that clear processes and communication in place uh, between the, the partners uh, to be able to identify families. The next myth um, really has to do with um, when children are placed outside the home in foster care and out of home care, um, there is an idea, oftentimes housing agencies in particular um, have required the child welfare agency to provide verification or documentation of a very, of the specific time frame of when that child or those children are gonna be returning to the home. Um, and will oftentimes require a family to they'll reduce the size of the housing voucher or require them to move to a smaller unit uh, while children are in at-home placement if the reunif unification doesn't occur within that specified time frame. And federal law and regulations are really set up to ensure that children temporarily in foster care are counted as a part of the household. So in other words, as long as the child welfare agency is one of the goals is still working with the family towards reunification, um, then the temporary absence of a child from the home and the time frame for that, which could change at a moment's notice, um, uh, really shouldn't be considered in, de in, determine in making those determinations. And, and all the housing authority really needs is the referral or certification from the child welfare agency in their files um, stating that the family is eligible. Um, and furthermore, I would argue that housing authorities probably don't want and shouldn't have detailed uh, child welfare case information in their, uh, in their records. Um, and this, uh, this temporary temporarily absent child um, uh, information really applies to most federally funded housing assistance programs. The, the last myth we're gonna cover today has to do with, um, we often hear from parents that, uh, they're afraid they're going to lose their housing if, if reunif reunification does not occur. In other words, if the family is housed with a voucher, but the case ends up going a different direction, um, or you know, when the children end up reaching the age of majority, um, if the family still needs assistance and qualifies for assistance, uh, the reality is that housing agencies are not um, to terminate a family from the program. Uh, but in these situations, they do have the option to move that family to um, an available housing voucher in their um, uh, regular housing program um, to free up a, a spot for another uh, family or youth uh, with FUP. So with, those are some of the common myths. Feel free to dig deeper um, along the way. And I think with that, um, Deirdre, do you wanna lead us in the next section? Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. So at this time, we're going to invite four child care, welfare, and housing leaders to introduce themselves and share a bit of their journey within jurisdictions in Washington State and Missouri, each of which were highlighted in our recent family housing group. So for the state of Washington, today we have with us Amanda Siebert, who is the Housing Programs Manager with Spokane Housing Authority, and Eric Larson, who is the Area Administrator with the Washington State Department of Children, Youth, and Families. And for the state of Missouri, um, coming from Kansas City, we have Sarah Thomas, who is the Alternative Care Program Administrator with the Missouri Department of Social Services and Children's Services D Division and Pradeep Singh, who is Director of the Housing Choice Voucher Program with the Housing Authority of Kansas City, Missouri. So first, we'll hear from Amanda and Eric. 
Thank you for being here with us. Hello, everyone. I will just introduce myself really quickly first. And I know uh, Eric has a lot of great stuff to say about the work we've done here as well. Um, <clears throat> I am the manager, as, as Deidre said, at the Spokane Housing Authority, and the Spokane Housing Authority has had FUP vouchers and a longstanding relationship with DCYF in our region, and I think that um, that strong partnership has really uh, behooved us in moving forward and um, in being able to help house families break down some of the barriers and to really streamline the FUP process. So we, we worked together um, in a cohort and we did some keeping families together work where we focused on enhancing that coordination, enhancing that partnership between the two agencies. Um, we, uh, through that cohort, were able to develop a new building or help, help to develop some new housing units, a new building in our area. And then we've worked really hard with Eric and his team, which he'll, he'll touch on, um, to increase support at DCYF, which has helped uh, tremendously with upping our utilization uh, of FUP vouchers and the success rate of households that are on FUP vouchers. There's a longer term um, engagement that seems to be happening with DCYF that we've been able to develop between our partnerships as well. So Eric, do you wanna talk a little bit about, about DCYF's role and some of the great stuff we've been able to achieve there? Absolutely. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you're at. My name is Eric Larson. I am an area administrator with the Department of Children, Youth, and Families here in Washington State. I've been involved with the FUP program since about 2015, 2014, 2015, and just have been so excited at how it has um, grown throughout these years. Um, I will say that it has been our collaboration with um, CSH and Keeping Families Together program that the myths that Andrew just talked about was really how we were operating in the past. And it wasn't until these myths were um, debunked that our program really started to, to thrive. So I appreciate that. Um, and I attribute that the increase in referrals to a lot of debunking these myths that Andrew just covered. So we're super thankful. We also collaborate with Catholic Charities here in um, Spokane County. Um, all of our families are referred to Catholic Charities as a beginning step to do um, a housing assessment, a SPADAT. Um, and they collaborate with with me by sending me their their SPADAT information. And then I check in our database, which is called FamLink, to see if the family is, do they truly have an open case with the department? Uh, um, and then I'll collaborate with the assigned social worker if they do, um, just to see where the family is at. Is it appropriate? And um, nine times out of 10, it's, it's completely appropriate to refer this fam family on to the referral process. We have, through time, found that there were kind of some some stalls in the process that we've had to figure out. Um, one of those is the actual application, the the FUP, app, the federal application, it can be kind of thick and daunting to a family who's already going through the trauma of being involved with our agency. Um, so, um, we have. Us trained with um, the help of Spokane Housing Authority. We have trained about um, eight staff. We have three three locations in Spokane. And so now we have staff at all three sites that can sit with a family and help them fill out that packet and get it turned in on time, um, which will help speed up the process. And that's been a huge, huge help. And um if even if families aren't eligible for FUP, then we go back to Catholic Charities and say, hey, looks like this family is not FUP appropriate. Um, are there other housing options that you may have for them? And they, Catholic Charities can continue to work with the family on other possible options that they have in Spokane. Um, I think uh, we are with this increase in referrals have definitely seen a large increase in the referrals coming through. Um, 
we're now working on trying to figure out how to assist families with the search efforts. Um, one of the unfortunate things is in our area, our vacancy rate is really, really low. So it can take a while for a family to find a unit um, um, and then get through that process. So uh, trying to find somebody or assistance for the family to help find a unit that's available, a landlord liaison. Say, I know that Spokane Housing Authority has um, one position there that is a landlord liaison. That's a huge help. Um, so working with other agencies in our area to create other landlord liaisons would be super helpful. And I'll just, just circle back kind of to what Eric was saying is in regards to what's increased the referrals as well as in addition to that myth busting that Andrew talked about and, and that we really walked through with uh, our, our cohort is having your local um, housing authority really examine their administration plan. One thing that I had seen is that our administration plan was quite old and had not been edited in quite some time. And it was more restrictive than it needed to be in regards to eligibility, um, in particular in relation to criminal activity um, in criminal history. And so I would say if you feel that you're having a tough time navigating getting families through the FEP uh, application process and you have a lot of denials that are maybe occurring, it might be something to convene with that housing authority and discuss what is in their admin plan and then align that with federal regulation. And so while a housing authority has absolute um, authority <laughs> to to outline things in their admin plan and they may not be willing to change that maybe looking at where can the can the needle be moved um and where can you decrease barriers because i know that our old admin plan prior to the edits we've recently done absolutely had some things that were not necessary that could be barriers to family so um i think that had we not sat in that partnership with DCYF and looked at some of those things, we would also not have the success rate with the referrals and the utilization that we currently have. All right, so at this point, we'll turn it over to uh, Missouri, Sarah and Sadiq. Hello, thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Sarah Thomas. I am the program administrator with Jackson County Children's Division, which is in Kansas City, Missouri. And Children's Division is our state uh, agency for kids when they enter foster care. Um, I currently oversee our One Roof program um, when it comes to doing all of the referrals. So I started back in this when we really kind of got it off the ground and running. Um, in about 2018, um, you know, during that time, we were meeting about weekly every other week to really formulate our process. What's the referral going to look like developing those relationships with our housing authority, um, as well as uh, some community support workers. So our how we do our process in Kansas City, um, when we have families that we think are eligible for a FUT voucher, the worker will do a referral and they'll send that referral to me to determine the eligibility. And then I assign it to a community support worker. So very similar to what Washington was talking about, um, having families dedicated in their office to do those applications with families. We refer that out um, and we have community support workers who do that. Um, and once they get assigned, they walk alongside the family the whole entire time, um, even through getting that family housed. And after they've been housed, they continue to work with that family to make sure they're getting their needs met. Um, they do the application with them. They go to the briefing with them or help them do the briefing if it's virtual. When they get the voucher, they help them locate um, housing, um, you know, meeting with landlords, doing the inspection, helping with deposits. So they are a crucial piece to our component here um, and our success having those uh, community support workers. Um, our court was a big partner in establishing this, making sure that they were on board um, and knew what the program was and knew when you know, when workers were going to court and referencing what one roof was and families getting vouchers, they knew what we were talking about. So we definitely looped them in and had those conversations with them. And then we really focused on our relationship with the housing authority. 
um, it just by building that relationship and having those formal meetings and getting to know who everyone was just made it easier to bust through the barriers that we did see when we first started our program. Uh, one of those being the criminal history, we were seeing a lot of denials from families that we were referring because of that. And uh, we were able to take it to our local housing authority and and talk through that with them. And now we've been able to kind of bust through that barrier and still refer families who do have a criminal history or who may be on probation and parole and still being able to get those approvals so that we can move forward uh, to help them reunify or keep their kids with them. So that's been a huge success. Since we've started um, in 2018, we our average time from voucher issuance to move in is about three and a half months. Um, the number of children that we've been able to reunify since we've started is 212. Uh, that's 212 children. We, um, 50 families that we've reunified, and we currently have 68 families housed with 43 of those being in aftercare, uh, meaning that they've gotten housed, they're doing so well that the community support worker was able to move them to an aftercare and not need to be um, so invested in their day-to-day -day case planning. Um, so we've seen a lot of success with that. Um, we have had to close 51% of our referrals. So, you know, from the time we, we make the referral, we think they're eligible, we think they're going to participate. Um, so we send it through and then they're either denied or the family stops participating, their goal changed. There could be many reasons for that for that closure that we keep data on all of that, just so we can kind of see where we're at and make sure we are reunifying the correct families. So I don't know, Pradeep, do you have anything you want to add and introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Sarah. Uh, my name is Pradeep Singh. I'm the, um, the director of Kansas City Housing Authority. Uh, and I just want to agree with Sarah about the relationship with One Roof. Uh, I think it's very important that we both organizations are on the same page. Uh, she uh, um, she was mentioning um, and the previous speakers from uh, Spokane was mentioning the barriers about criminal history, which is it's a huge barrier and as directors, I, I, I can only speak for myself, as director, I can make that change. I can make that decision because I can override the admin plan because it's at the, in our admin plan, it's at the discretion of the housing authority. But there's only like one or two factors that would be preventing um, a client um, that you cannot, um, you, you just cannot, uh, you know, accept uh, uh, the, through uh, HUD regulations, which would be a, a, sex, a sex offender and a, meta, uh, a meth lab being used in a, in, in a property. Other than that, you can look at the history and a decision can be made uh, whether or not to allow, allow the client uh, you know, to enter, uh, enter the program. And that's where uh, uh, one roof and the housing authority has come together to make those decisions and 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 help the families uh, get get into uh, get get into units. When the housing authority takes over, when we get the referral from uh, one roof, uh, particularly Sarah, <laughs> because that's where we get the, mainly our most of our referrals from. Uh, I mean, right now, currently, I'll talk uh, about our program. We have fifty five. Uh, vouchers that were issued to us, and now uh, 34 have been leased up already. So we're at a 62% uh, utilization. It's awarded, as mentioned earlier, FYI vouchers, uh, 59 of them uh, started August 1st. So we got, and I, I look at it along the same lines, FUP and FYI, it's the same program, basically. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty much the same. And now we got more vouchers to help out individuals what we can do about the wait list the wait the the wait list is really not the wait list is not really because these are targeted populations so once we put them on the wait list they're immediately pulled off because it's a targeted situation so we can have like for example we have 17,000 people on our waiting list and just say um well, we have an individual who uh who is an FUP is 17,001 
Well, we already know what our list looks like because there are no other person who's targeted in that 17,000 on the wait list. So that person who's 1701 gets pulled immediately. So we are able to brief them, issue the voucher and help them, uh, you know, help them uh, go out to search. What we did also, we started, uh, we started talking to them see and discuss the program with them to see if they'd be willing to take uh, the um, population into their units. We have to an FUP because it is a unique situation and they're willing to take it. So which eases the eases the leasing process and the barriers of clients going out into the you know uh, city and finding uh, finding units as we all know too the units are very because of the way the real estate market is it's very volatile it's very high so it is also another barrier where it it, it prevents uh our clients you know our FUP clients from getting um affordable housing in in, in major cities so I think uh by the housing authority also uh, finding out information on uh, which landlords can take it. We can amass a lot of units and make the process much quicker, which we have done here. Great. Thank you all so much. Uh, we're going to move um, into our next uh, session section, which is really a discussion with all of you. Um, the, kind of build on some of the themes that you've teed up. So um, during our panel discussion, Deirdre and I are going to lead the panel through some topics, as you see on the screen, kind of categorized uh, questions in that way. And then we will be um, integrating some questions uh, that you all have offered in the question and answer um, portion of Zoom. We also really encourage you to share your own examples and strategies in the chat with each other, because we know there are many folks on the line that have learned a great deal, that have tried things that have really uh, worked. Uh, and so please do share uh, uh, with your peers in that way. So, uh, and also, um, I believe Danielle is just rejoining. So we will invite Danielle as well as the folks from Spokane and Kansas City to all um, feel free to turn your cameras on and join us for this discussion. So Deirdre. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you all. So when I think of uh, keeping families together, um, it really means that there are hardworking people like yourselves working in sync breaking down barriers to help ensure families who you know live with sometimes unimaginable challenges feel heard and supported uh, to overcome in spite of those challenges. Um, and our club program and keeping families together approach really creates the opportunities for the families to hit a reset button and to land in a place that gives them the safety and reassurance of having a long lasting place to live. And it's the partnerships that's, you know, at the, the core of that. So one question that we wanted to pose and uh, is, you know, what is the importance of these partnerships between the Child Welfare Agency, the Housing Authority, and other community par partners to the parents that you serve? You know, what do you hear from the families about how these folks, how you all are all coming together? and I'll maybe toss it to Spokane first. And could you repeat the question? I'm sorry, I just had a hard time under hearing you. Sure, no problem. What is the importance of the partnerships that you have between all of your partners to the parents that you're serving? You know, how do they see this, this partnership benefiting them? So I, I believe our parents really really like and, and and our public defenders really like the collaboration um not only if a, if a client is housed with fup that's great they but also like i said earlier if if they if they don't qualify for fup or the cases 
literally just about to close um, or or whatever it may be, whatever reason they may not qualify, our collaboration with Catholic Charities will continue to work with that family on other potential housing options. And, and that's what I really like. I think also um, um, our, our, our tight collaboration that we have in working with each other, um, we really want to, we strive hard to get as many families housed through the program as possible, which um, I think is, is, is terrific. And the, um, I think our social workers and our supervisors really like having this resource. Um, it can, it uh, brings greater engagement between the social worker and the, and the parent as well. Um, brings greater engagement between the public defenders and the social workers. Um, so I think it's, 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 it's really, really important to have strong partnerships. Thank you. So um, another curiosity or another thing we wanted to try to highlight is certainly each of your agencies and systems have your own um, objectives that you have to strive for in your operation. How does the partnership with um, help your system and your agencies to meet their individual goals and to reduce other pain points along the way in terms of how you're serving? So how does it help you meet your goals? And then how does it also reduce any uh, challenges or pain points in the process? Sarah or Kadeem? Yeah, I think I would just say, you know, for us, it really does come down to that communication. We, you know, from the child welfare lens and our standpoint and our court standpoint is we want to get these families housed as soon as possible. Um, you know, that's our goal and be able to reunify the kids that had been removed from them and uh, you know, by building these partnerships and having this open communication with the team um, that anytime we do experience a pain point or a barrier, we can go to them and let them know what it is. And we're going to find a way to work through that. Um, even though we're not meeting as frequently uh, when we first started this, we still meet formally as a team at least every other month um, to every month to really have those conversations and keep keep those conversations fresh in our mind um, because one roof is important to us and having those meetings and continuing that conversation helps us build build through that and and get bust through those barriers, I guess, if you will. Right. Yeah. Communication is a key mm -hmm. to so many things. So Andrew, I'll toss it to you to start. Uh, great. Um, yeah, when we Thanks, Deirdre. When we think about um, accessing housing, you know, we certainly know that typically child welfare staff are not housing experts, nor typically are housing authority staff child welfare experts. Um, and so, you know, in thinking about that, what challenges might this present for families as they try to navigate these systems? And um, for those of you uh, from the system side, how have you and your partners managed this? Um, but I think, uh, you know, certainly, I don't know, Danielle, if you have any initial thoughts on the challenge for families or um, before we go further. Oops, you're on mute, Danielle. On accessing housing. Yeah, so yeah. challenge, yeah, the challenge when uh, child welfare workers aren't housing experts and housing authority staff aren't child welfare experts. And kind of just thinking about the challenge this presents for families that are trying to navigate the systems. Um, just any thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, I think personally for me, that was a long journey. Um, oftentimes I'll just speak for myself. Um, I had criminal history and I didn't really have support in knowing how to navigate those landlords or those apartment complexes and how to present myself. I ultimately, after being denied so much and learning my rights, was able to, um, you know, coordinate with both sides of those, you know, uh, organizations 
and other people who have been providing these services and almost have like a portfolio of here's my criminal history, right? I want to be transparent. And here's what I've done since then. Here are the things that I'm doing now. And these are my goals in the future. I even went as far as like asking my social worker <clears throat> to write something up about the cleanliness of my house, right? Like, or include that in photos. I've even invited landlords over, um, you know, because there's also another aspect to this is that a lot of times landlords have gotten some, I don't want to say bad, but bad players who've had Section 8 vouchers and have definitely made it hard for those coming behind. Now, um, the other piece about accessing housing with those two, you know, with, with the entities like and the barriers, um, just not knowing what they can and cannot do. Like, for example, I had to go, I wait, I swear to God, six months to get that letter saying that I kept to clean out. <laughs> I could have just, you know, I could have just um, utilized my reports, but I wasn't comfortable with all of the other information that was in there. So, yeah, I mean, I think it was worth it, though. And then I just look at it like this, like, you know, after they help, after they helped me and, and, and several other parents, they became more comfortable with it. And now they kind of felt more empowered as professionals to say, oh, I, yeah, you know what? We had someone do that too. Um, um, and then for, yeah, just knowing the laws and the rules, like, okay, if you've had a, a drug conviction, if you have been to treatment, there's no, you know, I will, I'll say in Washington state, there's no rhyme or reason they can deny you. In my experience, I don't know if anything's changed, but like, you know, so, yeah. Thanks, Danielle. Uh, oh, wait, oh, wait, one sorry. more thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then just being um, a TV survivor uh, is another one. Like you can't break your lease. Uh, a lot of parents don't know that. A lot of survivors don't know that. And I'll say there's a lot of professionals who don't know that. And it's just nobody sits around trying to figure out how to get, you know, housing if you've never had these barriers. So, yeah, it's just trial by error. Thanks, Danielle. I think you've made a strong case for the the importance of and uh, value in partnering with parents, with families, um, you know, in the work. Uh, yeah. I, what a great strategy as far as kind of having your housing resume and portfolio, resume, that's what I meant. right? That's a, <laughs> yeah. such a great strategy. Um, and uh, would either of the other, uh, either Spokane or Kansas City, want to weigh in on on uh, just kind of how you have managed this, or you know, any yeah. strategies or ideas? <laughs> Yeah, Andrew, uh, I found that I found that a lot of the, the reason why I got a lot of landlords coming on board now and is is because I personally talk to them. I have upper management talk to them. It's a different scenario when a caseworker does talk to a landlord, but you there's more weight when it comes from a director or uh, upper management. If I'm giving you if I'm telling you that, you know, we're explaining the situation, we've added it also. We think this is a good candidate and we're recommending it. If we're fine with it, you should be fine with it. That's that. And and if it's coming from a director or upper management, it does go a long way. So I think the involvement of upper management should be, you know, well, for me, for me, I'm involved always because I want to get these vouchers to the clients. They they need they they need it. Uh, they need it for the children. Uh, they need a uh, quick access. This is why we're trying to streamline everything. Uh, Sarah uh, knows knows about this. This is why we try to do it quickly. If if there's a, an issue, I do hear wind of it, and then I I have to I step in. These special programs is where upper management has to step in, and this is where you're gonna get landlords to you know believe in the process because they see you believe in it they'll believe in it also. And that's why I get a lot more landlords on board. Hey, I will just say, absolutely, that's extremely important. And I think that's a role that housing authority management absolutely should be in. We're fortunate here that we are a large area, but we have a close knit um, pool of landlords. And so we absolutely need to work on uh constantly we're working on cultivating and maintaining good relationships but uh one thing someone mentioned in the chat and i know eric mentioned it when we spoke a few moments ago but our landlord liaison that i have on staff is extremely helpful in this accessing housing uh issue and so um 
whether you call that a landlord liaison or a housing navigator, someone that can be in that role that can walk alongside with family and walk alongside families in that process and uh, talking to landlords, looking at units, building the housing resume, as, as Danielle mentioned, and also that those folks that are savvy in the law too, because we know that landlords oftentimes try to say they can or can't or don't have to do certain things, which maybe is not always the most current law. We'll say that to be fair. Um, but I think that that has been crucial in our success as well as being able to have a person that can walk alongside families and help them in that role. While they're certainly not child welfare experts, they have some knowledge and can also help to navigate and mitigate things with the social worker on the DCYF end as well. Probably makes a good case for the continued uh, kind of cross training or, yeah. you know, uh, collaboration as well. I think, Absolutely. why don't we move to the next, um, the next topic, Deirdre, do you want to take that? Sure. So um, what, um, have you seen systems obstacles or hurdles? Um, and from your experience, what changes should each partner consider making for the program to work best? I think I heard um, previously um, one of the housing authorities speak to the changes that you've made in your admin plan. But can you speak to, you know, in what ways have you all been able to make any changes or overcome, you know, internal barriers to the program? Uh, because of the way each agency is structured. I know I kind of already talked about our probation and parole changes that we've been able um, to make, and that's been really helpful just to be able to go to the housing authority if someone's denied and say, hey, can you take another look at this? Um, we're happy to get a letter from their probation officer, or parole officer that says what they're participating in. We've seen a lot of uh, success with that, them coming back and getting those approvals. One of the other things though, that we've seen that um, was a barrier that we were able to work through is the required documents for the application, you know, needing to have all the birth certificates and the social security cards. Um, especially the social security cards, because that takes so long to get back once you fill out the application for to get a new card. That one of the things the housing authority has allowed us to do is for me to write a letter saying, you know, we have access to the screens that shows social security number. And so I can type a letter that says, you know, these children um, have been referred through one roof with their parent, the social security numbers are below, and they will take that letter as a social security card until that parent can apply and get that social security card in the mail. Um, and so that's been huge to be able to allow us to move forward with those families and not allow it to be a delay uh, for their application. Thank you, Sarah. Any others? Yeah, I agree with Sarah. Uh, Spokane Housing Authority has also been instrumental in allowing that almost that same exact change. We. Uh, we just do a little different. We don't write a letter. I do a print screen of our person management page uh, for each child and adult on the referral, at which shows their, uh, and then I'll, I'll circle their social security number or I'll circle their birth date. Um, and that I think the preferred, I think any housing authority would prefer a birth certificate and a um a social security card, but this is a great temporary fix to get the process started so that they, the parents can get what, what they need for their family. Um, that has been huge. Also, like Sarah, she has an agency that does, that helps out the, the clients fill out the packet. I mentioned this earlier. And then we have um, staff at each of our sites that has, will sit down with the clients and help them fill out the packet. That's been a huge, huge um, piece of, of getting referrals turned in before we were handing it over to the social worker and or to the parent. And both the social worker, like Andrew said, is who is not a housing expert. And, and then the parent who's completely overwhelmed by, by being involved in the child welfare system already. And then we're giving them this huge packet to fill out, which is daunting and overwhelming. Um, so having these people in place has been a, a, a huge, a huge um, assistance. Thank you so much, Andrew. We can move on. Yeah. 
I think that segues nicely actually into the, the last topical bucket, um, which has to do with services and supports. And I think uh, all of you have talked some about, you know, especially on the front end, right? As far as uh, helping and supporting through your partnership, uh, the process for families to be able to complete the housing paperwork, navigate the process and search for and secure housing successfully. Really in thinking about once families are housed and thinking even longer term where, you know, certainly helping families to, you know, to stabilize and sustain and thinking about all the household members and the different needs that they identify or have, um, uh, partnering with families in their in their care, partnering with others in the community that have resources are, as you think about, you know, your journey that you've been on, how have you been thinking about or coordinating for some of the services needs, you know, that come up for families, um, you know, including at the time their child welfare case might be closing, there may continue to be uh, needs that they have across other disciplines as well. So I don't know if any of you want to kind of weigh in on that particular piece um, as far as how you've been thinking about that or the journey you're on? I'll weigh in for a moment. Um, as Eric mentioned earlier, he talked about our partnership with Catholic Charities in our community. And really that's, uh, Catholic Charities is just the contract holder for the coordinated entry system in our community. And so it's really a partnership with the coordinated entry system um, that we have families go through. And so we, as um, as our landlord liaison here and as Eric's fam uh, caseworkers are working with families at DCYF, we make sure that we have people that are referred to any possible support that's available to them. And we um, really work together with DCYF. I had mentioned that we have looked to do more long-term like follow-up. And so it is a barrier sometimes for families, as you mentioned, Andrew, when the case is closed, and if DCYF is not able to assist for whatever reason after that. But um, luckily, through our strong partnership with DCYF, I'm able to reach out and say we still have an issue and we can partner together to look for referrals um, in the community. So I think um, it's important that even if a case is closed to not just say, yep, case is closed, no one can help the, the folks and to continue that partnership in the spirit of truly helping the family. Yeah, and I think that's uh, one thing that's so great about our community support workers because they aren't through children's division that when our case closes, they can remain on for as long as that family needs. So we have our very first family that we housed. Um, she, I mean, she got her voucher, she got housed, she got her kids back right away and her kid was released, um, her case that doesn't happen every time, but our very first family that happened with, and still, you know, years into this program, we still get updates on her from the community support worker because she does still have needs and she does still need that support. Um, and so that's what's great about those being in the community is they can continue to work with those families as needed until the family says, I don't need your help anymore. Um, you know, I'm kind of on my feet and I'm good. So that's been uh, huge to still get those services post our closure. That's great. I just quickly, Danielle, do you have any um, thoughts to offer around the need for ongoing services and supports access for families? You know, the what or the how of that? If not, that's okay. Just wanted to give you a chance before we move to the first audience question. I think you're on mute as well. I don't. I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. So uh, Leland's from Ray from CSH is joined, uh, and so I'll turn it to Deirdre and Leah for the. Thanks, Andrew. So yes, we are very excited to see. Uh, we've seen several questions popping into the chat throughout, and so Leah is going to help navigate uh, raising some of those questions uh, for our panel um, to try to address for us. So Leah, do you have a question for us? Yeah, so our first question really builds on the last topic around services and that ongoing support. And so could you give some examples of funding sources you're using to help pay for those services? So whether it's that housing navigator on the housing authority side, or maybe it's the supportive services to go along um, once families have moved into housing, how are you paying for that right now? And maybe are there plans for down the line, what else you might be looking towards to pay for some of those services? 
So, who wants to take that one first? I can go ahead. Um, in Kansas City, we don't pay for the um, community support workers. That's something that they've entered into this program voluntarily. Um, some of them do do grant funding um, and are able to serve in this role through grants that they've received. Um, but as far as us paying for that, we don't do that. Um, if the family needs something outside of what the community support worker can provide, then we do have funds to help provide some of those services um, if needed, therapy, drug treatment, what, whatever that might be. Um, when it comes to you know deposits for the house or um, helping with that stuff, the community support workers sometimes do have money um, from their funding that they can help provide some of those deposits. And then we can also make a request for a crisis fund um, to help supplement um, some of that. And Sarah, yeah. who, is, who is the source of the crisis fund? So the, is that underneath the state or what is that? Funded? Yes, it's the state, uh, so Children's Division. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay. Anyone else want to tackle that question? Well, on the on the housing authority side, uh, it's only the funding that we get from uh, FUP from the government, so it's only for the vouchers. So anything else will be have to come from the outside. Uh, even when you speak of a navigator, the navigator uh, either is going to be from the HCV side, housing choice voucher side, or in the case of emergency housing vouchers. Uh, you can hire a navigator through that program. So what we use is uh, we actually use the nav the different. Oh, Pradeep, is it uh, is his sound going in and out for everyone else? Okay, I thought so. Okay, can you uh, can you hear me right now? We can now, but it, we lost what you said earlier. Oh, yeah. I, I was saying that the funding mostly is from uh, the FUP program, the budget authority. Uh, it's it's for the voucher only. It, there's no other extra money in there for security deposits or anything like that or any type of supportive services. Any other service that we like a navigator that we would have would be through uh, other programs where we're paying for the navigator. So we split we split the finances between all the departments. So we kind of use the navigator to try to help out, um, you know, the special programs, including FUP, if we if we have it at the time, if they're available to search for, uh, you know, search for uh, units. Thank you. Eric, I think you were going to say something. Yeah, in Washington State, we try to, uh, the state of Washington will pay for services as long as the case is open. And um, even in discussions of getting cases closed, uh, we always try to have some sort of a support system for the family, whether it's a community support system or, or familial support system. Um, I would say about... Um, and Amanda can correct me if I'm wrong, probably about 80%, if not higher, of our FUP recipients are um, on welfare and have services through our Department of Social and Health Services, totally separate umbrella from Department of Children, Youth, and Families. It's their TANF grant um, that they will also have ongoing services um, for as well. So in collaboration with our um, DSHS, Department of Social and Health Services, um, and then other community services that parents can engage in. Great. I think, you know, certainly in looking across the country, we've seen a number of different uh, strategies, um, you know, deployed in different jurisdictions where folks are at least for some aspect of services, you know, leveraging, you know, or kind of testing um, what it looks like to bring in, you know, maybe a piece or at least for a time, you know, through, you know, whether it's some through Medicaid, some through um, uh, other kind of behavioral health related uh, funds through community-based programs and services, partnering with family resource centers and, 
and the like, and kind of looking at the, you know, kind of common needs of families and supports and how to, you know, how to really leverage uh, and align those, um, looking at health centers, federally, federally qualified health centers. There's a number of different strategies. And then even within some of the, you know, the public agencies and human services and child welfare, looking at where there are opportunities to align, you know, with within child welfare, you know, some of the in-home um, uh, kind of preservation prevention type services, many of those we've seen uh, as a part of the larger model of services to support uh, families. So where a housing voucher can really, you know, allow a family to preserve and, you know, then bringing in some of the evidence-based programs within the Family First Clearing House, you know, as a piece for a time or looking at, um, you know, promoting safe and stable families are different, you know, just kind of looking at some of the, the different funding and every jurisdiction has different, a different context, a different environment as far as what, you know, what and how, you know, and thinking about your community-based uh, service providers, you know, that are trying really hard to serve families in, in, and are just, you know, some of the same families maybe and are just missing that housing piece and how to bring those pieces together. So just wanted to offer that you know, I think those are great examples and and uh, encourage folks in the chat even to continue to share things you've tried, you know, as far as funding. Um, Leah, do we have another question from Yes. The yep. Audience? So I, um, there's a couple of questions specific to Spokane and how you've been utilizing your FUP. And so I'm just wondering if people have a chance to answer that maybe in the chat or in the Q&A, that could be helpful because it's really specific to how you are using those FUP now and what, what kind of impact you're having with um, Native American families and African American families. And the question for everybody is, so in the communities that don't have FUP or they might be thinking about growing their FUP or their FUP program and their partnerships, why, why did you take FUP on? Why did you, what was it that uh, brought you all to the table and said, yes, I'm gonna apply to HUD and yes, I wanna work together. So what, kind of how does this work help you move towards your goals and what recommendations do you have for communities that might be looking to put these partnerships together in the future to apply for FUP? Excellent. Does somebody wanna chime in first on that one? I guess I would say, you know, uh, the, the old saying is it takes a village. It really does. So the more community agencies that you can bring together um, that have a common goal uh, um, of housing youth and families, um, the better. Um, I think our FUP process was pretty stagnant early on. And then we, Spokane was awarded a grant um, called the 100 Day Challenge, specifically for youth. And that brought a, a bunch of agencies together with the common goal of, of housing youth. And then from there, it grew. And then we um, became in collaboration with CSH and the in one roof. So um, I'd say the more community agencies you can get at the table early on and consistent, the better. Sounds like it's all about relationships. In this. Anybody else have any ad additional thoughts on on this particular question about kind of you know even thinking about your system or your agency's goals and how this collaborative work can help meet them? Um, if not, that's okay. But just you know, kind of want to offer a, sh a chance. All right. Um, I think with that, um, we are starting to get close to uh, the end of the webinar. Uh, I certainly encourage you know, panelists to take a look at the Q&A to see if there's any answers you can provide in writing um, uh, in the uh, Q&A section or in the chat um, in the next few minutes that we have together. Uh, I think Deirdre and I really wanna thank all of you for being a part of this um, excellent panel. I, you know, in many ways wish we had, I, th I feel like we could probably go on for hours of pulling on so many of the threads um, that you all teed up and just really appreciate your uh, contributions to the field as, as um, I think folks from across the country are together continuing this, this journey. 
I think with that, I would like to invite Margie Hunt from Casey Family Programs to start our process of uh, closing out. Margie? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. And, and I'd like to just ditto um, a big thank you to our presenters for taking the time and for your commitment to this work. Um, I think everybody knows who's on it. I see the numbers are quite a lot of people. This is not easy work, um, but it is critical work as we work to um, help support families staying out of the child welfare system and getting out of it as quickly as possible, I should say, families and children in connections. And Casey is very much committed to this work. Um, we look forward to supporting anybody on this call, um, both with the Corporation of Supportive Housing, um, to really dig into this and um, have the ability to support through some technical assistance and other ways that we can at least get the conversations moving, or if they're already moving and you need some support and moving them further, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we really, it, it is an example that we just saw of people really taking charge of this and it's, it's sticky work, but it is very critical work. So we wanna help in any way that we can. Um, and thank again to all the speakers uh, for your work and your commitment here and people for joining. So thank you, Andrew. Great, thanks, Margie. Um, as you'll see on the next uh, slide, uh, we certainly encourage you to um, think about something that you will uh, take with you or that you can uh, plan doing because of your participation today. And we invite you to share it in the chat with others to kind of prompt their thinking. Um, we, there are a number of resources out there. You know, the chat has been flooded uh, with a number of them. Uh, we certainly encourage you to reference the briefs that go into much more detail about uh, and have links um, to things we talked about today. We encourage you to visit the HUD Family Unification Voucher Program webpage, which has a lot of information about who's received uh, awards, you know, in the past, uh, copies of prior uh, notices of funding opportunity, um, the latest guidance and frequently asked questions and, and those types of uh, uh, opportunities. And then uh, we also invite you to check out the Housing and Child Welfare Resource Hub on the National One Roof webpage that uh, you can, we've linked here and you can, uh, I think we'll also drop it in the, the chat or we'll do so. Um, which is a, a great place to find other examples of folks in the field and reports, uh, resources, guidance, uh, tools that could be applied in your work with families and youth related to child welfare and housing. Um, I think one uh, other thing I'll just mention, you know, today was very focused on families and we understand that there's probably a strong interest in uh, youth and young adults as well. And so we are uh, planning a release of a complimentary uh, brief um, on federal housing vouchers for young people by October and then watch for a similar virtual convening in early November that we'll send to all of you uh, to invite you to um, to have a similar discussion, but really focused on young people. We do invite you to complete a short post webinar survey that is in the chat. Um, as Margie mentioned, we really encourage you uh, to reach out if you have uh, questions, want support, you may have technical questions about eligibility or implementation, you know, certainly read the briefs, but also uh, you may uh, on your journey want to explore further support from CSH, Casey Family Programs, and our partners. And so the survey will allow you to indicate potential interest. And also um, we are planning some relevant peer discussions, collaborative learning opportunities likely in uh, early 2024. And so there's a, a way to kind of indicate that you want to be invited into to those as well. Um, so I think with that, um, as you can see on the next slide, there's um, an email address that was also, I believe, shared in the chat. Uh, feel free, you know, not only in the survey, but you can reach out directly um, to that email address. Uh, and we really want to, again, just thank you for taking the time uh, for your interest in this very important topic um, and really encourage you to continue begin or continue in your journeys of child welfare and housing partnerships in support of um, uh, outcomes for children and families. So thank you for joining today and have a great rest of your day. Take care.